I don't think uh, you or the audience will be surprised to hear I'm rather on John Crackett's side of the argument. Um, you know, we, like people out in the audience, are engaged in health and safety because we know it's necessary to protect real people from real risks. Uh, and in fairness to Lord Young, I mean, I thought it's perfectly reasonable to say, as he did, that it is a risk to all of us that health and safety has in some form of Scotland's reputation. I don't have a problem with that. But I do think uh, we all have a problem if we allow this particular issue to dominate the debate. Uh, and that's where I think I'd, I'd slightly take issue with some of the things he said. I think it's important that we all do our bit in countering these myths. It's also important that we recognise that we will always be faced with this kind of commentary. It's never going to die away completely. We should fight the good fight. But we should also, I think, accept that from time to time we're going to get these problems. And I say that because I think it's very easy for people like ourselves as, as regulators, Gavin, to get diverted from what we really need to do and really need to regulate into this particular debate. Uh, and I have to say, I look around at my fellow regulators, for example, quote an example at random, the Financial Services Authority, I think they might have perhaps wanted to spend more time on the big picture and less time worrying about the detail of consumer sales of particular policies. Just as a matter of interest, have you ever received any corrections ever on any of these stories? Yes, and we have actually. Um, I would say we try and correct every story we, we discover to be untrue. We generally find that the sort of publication rate of corrections is about 1 in 20. Uh, and as colleagues will know, if you look on our website, we now publish uh, our correspondence with various recalcitrant newspapers so that actually it's clear on the public record that what they have claimed is untrue. Um, we might come back to that and how, how to, to improve uh, image questions in a moment, but as you say, there are, there are much, much bigger issues here. One which John Crackett raised and ra was raised in the, in the uh, breakout sessions yesterday, at least the ones I attended, was this question of relevance. Um, the reason why some of these stories have some resonance yeah. is that people do occasionally have to do tick boxes and, and do things which are regarded as burdensome. How do you ensure that health and safety training is relevant to the people involved? Well, I think it's actually an issue, certainly for us, but it's an issue, if I may say so, for everyone in the audience uh, as well. Because it is actually a question of making sure that people actually go on courses which are suitable for the actual health and safety problem they have. And I say I came across an extraordinary example of exactly what you're describing, Gavin, uh, recently, where at least in one part of the country, when um, uh, people have community service orders, so they have to go and you know paint the walls or whatever. Uh, in fact, they are given, if you can believe it, a two-week induction course on health and safety. Uh, and I challenge anyone to say that that can in any way be relevant or actually help people deal with probably the one or two relatively minor health and safety issues they need to be aware of. So I think there is a problem here. And um, but as I know, as an organisation which invests heavily in training, these problems arise all over the shop in training that people pick what look like nice courses in nice locations. They don't always pick the one which is actually suitable for what they need to be trained in. So I think managers have the responsibility. Uh, and I think there's no way out of that because it's actually managers who, who create the demand. And also, frankly, it's managers who can get rid of these pointless courses by just not being prepared to sponsor anyone on.